Good afternoon. My name is Klaus Röbel and I want to welcome you this afternoon to a panel discussion entitled Fact Not Fiction, The Truth About In-Office BPH Treatment. My name is Klaus Röbel and I'm currently the chair of the Department of Urology at UT Southwestern and I will introduce our panelists a little bit later in the program. What we're talking about today is in-office BPH treatments and I'll set the stage a little bit pitching medical treatment versus surgical and in-office treatments and giving a little bit of a background. Last year, this planet Earth crossed the 7 billion population mark and between the year 2000 shown here and the year 2020, the population is scheduled to increase from 6 to 7.7 .7 billion. The reason that I think this is an important is because it has a lot to do with increase in life expectancy and longevity and this translates into a growth of what I think is the target population not just for BPH but prostate cancer and many other urological conditions as you well know. The segment of the population 65 and older will double between 2000 and 2030 so clearly the greatest population increase isn't that primary target for prostatic conditions. And as you see here on this slide, both histological BPH shown in the bar graph and prostate cancer shown in the line graph increases steadily but somewhat exponentially almost with increasing age. So it is clear that in the future there will be a lot of our patients coming to us seeking help for avoiding symptoms associated with BPH. The AUA has guidelines. This comes from the 2010 guidelines. And as you can see, the number one recommendation is medical therapy, whether it's alpha blocker, 5-ARI, or combination therapy. Then there's a recommendation for minimally invasive treatments. TUNA and TUMT are listed here. It's called Prostiva nowadays. And then there are surgical therapies. But the number one recommendation is medical treatment. And as of this year, we actually have not three, but four classes of drugs available at our disposal the alpha blockers, the 5-ARIs, antimoscarinics in combination usually, and now PDE5 inhibitors. Now, these drugs are heavily used, and in the United States, as you'll see here, 57% of patients are on drugs, 40% are on watchful waiting, probably appropriate for minimal or very moderate avoiding symptoms without bother, and only 1% of the population undergo a minimally invasive procedure and 2% a surgical procedure. The total number in the United States is about 120 to maximally 140,000 for those procedures. In Europe, it's uh, almost the same. A little bit less watchful waiting, 73% of patients are on drugs. However, 3%, the exact number, the exact very small proportion, one out of 30 patients for surgery or minimally invasive treatments. These drugs come at a price. Dr. Eigelhardt published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine some years ago pointing out that most countries quite judiciously use their health care expenditure appropriate for their gross domestic product shown on the x-axis. This is the health care expenditure and you can see most countries follow a trajectory by which the health care expenditure is commensurate with the GDP. Except he pointed out the United States right here where we are far above that particular trajectory. And as you see here on this table from the same paper, the overspending takes place in outpatient care and as I frame it here, for drugs and non-durables. If you look at OECD data, rather good data set actually, I bet you couldn't pick out which of these bar graphs represents the United States. This shows pharmaceutical or drug expenditure as percent of total expenditure on health. And I will reveal to you that the United States is way down at the bottom with 12%. But this is misleading. Well, you don't look at it as a percent of total health care expenditure, but rather at the total expenditure in dollars and purchasing parity, the United States is way ahead at about $875 per person per year. Most other countries, somewhere between $200 and $500, as you can see. So there are issues. Cost is one issue. Efficacy is another issue. I'll talk a lot about medical therapy, but you all know that these medications, alone or in combination, induce an improvement by maybe three to six points. This is from the AUA guidelines. Let me show you a somewhat complex slide where we turn this diagram on its head a little bit. 
On the x-axis, I show you here a baseline symptom severity score, and on the y-axis, a change from the baseline score. So what you'll see here is it takes a certain drop from baseline for the patient to say, I feel good about this, or very good, or this was an excellent improvement. Now, if I superimpose what I showed you about our drugs, it doesn't quite get there. It gets us to poor to fair for many patients, but it doesn't get us to good or very good in terms of the improvement. And this phenomenon is, of course, worse when the patients start with more severe symptoms. So in order to get there, we need an improvement by more than that. We need an improvement by over 10 points. In other words, we need to move this whole box down and have drugs, which we don't right now, that induce a greater improvement. So there are issues with the drugs, the cost, the overall efficacy, and this is from the AUA guidelines, and I'm not telling you any numbers you couldn't look up. This shows for the drug the improvement I mentioned, three to six points, but for the minimally invasive treatments, an improvement above 10 points, just exactly what I pointed out. So what's wrong now? Why is it that in Europe and in the United States there is such a rare use of minimally invasive treatments, and why is it that this picture graced the cover of the Journal of Urology, pointing out huge geographic differences in the utilization of a treatment that should be appropriate homogeneously across the United States, shown here for microwave treatment and shown here for tuna, the same thing. Just huge geographic variations in the uptake of this technology. And I propose to you five reasons why the utilization may not be as high and my, why there might be pockets of underutilization or very high utilization or appropriate utilization. There's always this issue of overly optimistic single-center trials that were published with glorious results, followed by a multi-center randomized trial that didn't look quite so good. We saw this in the 1990s with hyperthermia. There were seven companies making devices of this nature. And as it turned out, in a randomized controlled trials, the hyperthermia was just as good or as bad in case may be as a sham treatment in terms of symptom improvement and, as you see in the next slide, in terms of flow rate improvement. No difference. So the hyperthermia was off the table, but it left a bad taste in our collective memory, I would argue. Secondly, there are difficulties in operationalizing the office-based aspects of the treatment without causing pain. I know that many of you have that fear or had bad experiences. Our panel today will share with us how they solve this problem, how they operationalize these treatments in their office practice. There's also difficulties in finding who's just exactly the right patient. Which patient can I uh, use for this treatment? Who is a good candidate? Who is an acceptable candidate? Not everybody's an ideal candidate. I suggest also to you that in the past, we oftentimes haven't given false promises, I'd almost want to say. Proxy outcomes, we were supposed to look at and say, oh, this looks good, let's do the treatment. So we were shown a piece of a histology with not much explanation saying, look here, this is necrosis, this is what it does. Well, the Thermatrix treatment doesn't induce a great deal of necrosis, and in fact, the long-term efficacy didn't quite hold up. We were oftentimes shown proxy information, heating patterns of antennas that don't necessarily translate into clinical efficacy, or at least not directly. We were shown MRIs, but we treat human beings. We don't treat the MRIs. We don't want to see a dark spot on an MRI. We want to see an improvement in the symptom score. So clearly, these are reasons, I believe, why these treatments haven't been as popular as they may should be and used as widely or as homogeneously as they could be. There's also the suspicion of high retreatment rates. We don't want this in our patient population. We want a reliable treatment that works and it doesn't have to be redone. Retreatment rates vary greatly in the literature. These are some published results with great differences. And here from one very specific treatment, a 30 to 40 percent retreatment rate over five years. We'll ask our panel about the literature and about their own experience. So when we're talking today about office-based treatments, we're not talking about the way back when history, the old devices, the initial hyperthermia devices, and then the early devices, the BSD microwave, and the early developments with the tuna, which used seven minutes for each lesion. 
the Prostatron, which is now off the table, the second generation tuna, the first generation Targus device, and then in the year 2000, the precision tuna device down to four minutes now, the Thermatrix I mentioned, which was introduced, the Prosta Lund introduced in 2002, and then came the CTC, the Targus, which fundamentally resembles today's device, the Precision Plus tuna down now to three minutes in 2003, the Pro Leaf device, which came and actually this year will leave the market uh, as of June 2012. No, we're talking about the Prostiva radio frequency, formerly known as tuna. And in some of the literature, you see the name tuna utilized, which is now down to two minutes and 20 seconds for a lesion at 110 degrees. And we're talking about cooled thermotherapy or CTT as we use it. And we use that term today throughout our panel discussion describing the microwave treatment as you will know it as microwave. Both these treatments are now distributed and supported by urologics, I should mention, both the Prostiva and the cooled thermotherapy. Let me now introduce our panel. Dr. Fallon, who is a partner in urologic physicians in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He has over 15 years experience with in-office treatment, both Prostiva and cooled thermotherapy. Dr. Robert Pugash, who is the medical director for Pacific Coast Urology, comes to us from California with over 14 years experience with both cooled thermotherapy and Prostiva, and Dr. John Harp from Southeast Michigan, who practices there at the urologic clinic, a strong user of both CTT and Prostiva. So gentlemen, I set out the task, and the first order of business for us is to identify the right patient, the ideal patient for an office-based treatment. What does this patient look like? What are the classic characteristics? And how do we go about finding that patient? I may start with Dr. Fallon to give us a little insight in that. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Werburn, for that very thorough yet brief review. Uh, I'm Mark Fallon, and I am a private practice urologist in Minneapolis. So on a daily basis, I'm evaluating men with obstructive voiding symptoms. And I think that my ideal patient is not too dissimilar from the patients presented in the papers. However, uh, we don't always have the ideal patient. But regarding the, the, the primary patient that I'm looking for, it's going to be somebody who has primarily obstructive voiding symptoms, somebody who has normal bladder function, so they haven't yet developed retention, somebody who has the what I would say the ideal prostate size, uh, 20 to 50 or 60 grams in size, uh, for somebody having cool thermal therapy, they're not going to have a large median lobe. Somebody that I perceive is going to be able to tolerate an office procedure. And then an ideal patient, I really don't want to have to manage significant comorbidities in the office. And I also think if we can find patients before they have a significant change in their bladder, before they have lost the elast elasticity and compliance, we're going to have better results. That said, our true target population rarely is the ideal patient. We're seeing patients who come in too late to see us, so they already have severe voiding symptoms. We're also seeing patients who you might perceive them to be better patients in the operating room for a laser or possibly a TERP, but they're hesitant, they don't want to go to the operating room, or they're not good medical candidates. So in private practice, we can't always treat the ideal patient. We have to take all comers. And I believe these therapies are capable of doing that. So I think that's a very important first point and first observation, the difference between trials where we have lots of inclusion and exclusion criteria. We can pick the patients and we have certain outcomes that are then observed. I should say nobody should expect exact the same results in their private practice because as Dr. Fallon points out, you'll have to treat the patient as they come through the door and they may not do you the favor of coming early. They may have a trabeculated bladder. They may have a poorly compliant bladder or to choose a hypoactivity, and they may have conditions that produce a less than optimal outcome. Nonetheless, they deserve our attention and our treatment. It's good to have an ideal in mind, but you can't always get it. So let's say you have a patient who comes in, is interested in it. How do you go about the evaluation? What do you think is essential, and what do you think is optional in the way of the evaluation of these patients? 
any of the men coming into my office who are presenting with obstructive voiding, I'm considering them for all of the different options. And so right away, I want to make sure I get the data that I need, which is I, I really feel strongly the AUA symptom score is important. And I think that for me, I personally go through the AUA symptom score with the patient so that they know exactly what the question means and they answer appropriately. All of my patients are going to have a urinalysis, obviously, and maybe a culture if indicated, a physical exam, and yes, a PSA. I know there's some uh, debate about that currently, but uh, in this case, we're treating patients and we're diagnosing patients. So this is a diagnostic PSA. I want to make sure I'm not offering an in-office procedure for BPH when the patient might have cancer. I believe a post-void ultrasound for residual is important, and I make sure that those patients have voided in my office right before the ultrasound, and then I always ask if they feel like that was a representative void. Uh, for many of the patients, they get a Euroflow. Sometimes that's not possible. Uh, office cystoscopy, I will perform on men who have severe irritative symptoms or other symptoms that I believe might indicate another diagnosis. Any patient who I believe is going to go on to have an in-office procedure, I believe office ultrasound or cystoscopy is very important. And then select patients who have very high residuals or patients who have severe irritative symptoms I'm going to perform urodynamic studies just so I get to know a little bit more about them. It's an interesting point, and thank you for bringing up this observation. Uh, the town hall debate yesterday and the 5 p.m. release of the U.S. Preventive Services, Services Task Force downgrading PSA to a D um, applies to the screening setting. I, I wonder in my own mind, uh, how are we going to deal with patients who have a TERP or laser ablation or a BPH procedure are we not allowed to use the PSA? Is it a bad idea? Personally, I, I agree with you. I think it's a really good idea to get a PSA because I wouldn't want to stumble, let's say, in a TURP and be greeted with a lot of cancer in the chips, things that we had uh, put behind us for the last 20 years. So it's a very important point to consider. So the cystoscopy is essential to make sure the patient is a good candidate both on, based on anatomy, the appearance of the bladder, and the middle lobe for you. Yes, I wouldn't necessarily say that cystoscopy is needed for all men be evaluated for obstructive voiding, but if I'm going to choose one of the in-office procedures, I think we really need to know, does he have a large intravesical middle lobe? Because I don't think those are the best patients for yeah. cool thermal therapy. I have a feeling if we would poll the audience, many would say that the office cystoscopy serves them as the litmus test. Will the patient tolerate it well or not so well? Does this help you too in that setting? In, in many instances, yes. If, if a patient has a lot of trouble with a cysto, I'm pretty sure they're not going to tolerate an office-based procedure. And, and that's just the way it is. You want to you do what's right for your patient. Yeah. Dr. Hopp, how about you? Do you agree with the assessment? Do you have additional points that you would consider in the assessment of your patients? Indeed, I do. Uh, patient selection is probably the most important thing to our success in these, for these procedures. When a patient presents with these BPH symptoms, I start by painting the picture for them. I, I introduce a new paradigm in, in care of these patients. Medication, minimally invasive procedures, surgical procedures requiring the operating room. I like a trial of alpha blockade therapy. I'd like to think of the minimally invasive approaches as a first line approach. We're not burning bridges if it doesn't work. We can still proceed to the next step if they need it. The people that respond to alpha block th therapy usually do very well and, and get a nice uh, result with these minimally invasive procedures. I also include I like to think of surgery as kind of a last defense. I don't want to put them through that at an early stage. I also like to do a transrectal ultrasound because if I'm going to do a prostiva procedure, it's important to know the transverse and actual size of the prostate and any asymmetries. I, I believe that at times prostiva is very, is very operator dependent and, and I think we a lot of times perhaps using uh, that type form of energy and radiofrequency, it can, you can under-treat those patients. 
So it's an interesting point. There's actually a paper published, and I believe uh, some years ago an analysis was done. Patients who responded to alpha blockers responded well, or better I should say, to minimally invasive treatments. In that case it was microwave or CTT, if you will so. And many of you may know that there was a theory, and I don't know if it's true, proven, or unproven, that the heat treatment ablates alpha receptors in the prostate on a permanent basis. This is at least one of the MOAs that has been discussed. Now, Dr. Hopp, you bring up a very important point. You like the ultrasound, you look at the anatomy. Dr. Fallon wants to look at the anatomy, wants to see the middle lobe. Now, these two procedures that are available today through your logics, uh, Prostiva on the one hand side and the CTT, they just couldn't be more different. And the CTT, you put a catheter in, and you almost could walk out of the room and let it do its thing, if that wouldn't be a bad thing to do. You're supposed to monitor it, of course, but you, the machine does it, basically, provided you give the right length information on the urethra. But the Prostiva is a heavily operator dependent. You control the needle application, the needle depths. You have to measure the widths. You control the number of application, whether you treat a median lobe. So Dr. Pugash, how do you go about sorting out which one of those two rather different procedures you choose? And you are one who has used both extensively, I know, from conversations. I have. The first uh, issue to bring up is that you have to think about an office-based treatment, whether it's Prostiva, or cool thermotherapy, whether you're using radio frequency waves or microwaves, is very similar in the sense that what you're doing is heating prostate tissue to the point where you cause coagulative necrosis. Now, in the early days of uh, in-office treatments, we did not see the results we see today because of lower energy machines. And as we pointed out in some of the previous slides, we've now evolved to a technology that generates significant heat and significant reduction in the size of a prostate. So we come down to what I consider the two best therapies, cool thermotherapy using microwaves and Prostiva using radio frequency. And the question is, when do you use one versus the other? Well, in a perfect world, when you're treating your patient, if you have a prostate somewhere between 20 and perhaps 100 cc's in size, and you have a prostate that has nice symmetrical lateral lobes, does not have a large median lobe, Cool thermotherapy is an ideal procedure. It's going to be well tolerated by your, by your patient. It's relatively straightforward and simple to perform. It's a good answer. But as we know, not all prostates are perfect. And so we'll see them come in different sizes and shapes. Thanks. So we may have asymmetry to a significant degree. We may have a very short prostatic urethra. We may have a significant median lobe, and especially those that protrude into the bladder are particularly problematic for cooled thermotherapy. That's where a procedure like Prostiva comes in because you can look at that tissue, you can target that tissue, and direct the heat directly into the areas that you feel need treatment. What are the size limitations, absolute terms for the microwave? You suggested for the CTT on the slide uh, less than 100 grams. In general, if you look at how we use the two technologies, we'd go up to about 50 for Prostiva, and we can go higher with cool thermotherapy. We can go as high as 100. I, I would agree that um, the size of the prostates that you can treat in the office are over and above what I would have thought. And so I've had patients have had urinary retention, elderly patients, nursing home patients, I've treated them safely, and many of them are now without a catheter. They're as happy as any patient that you can find. Mm -hmm. And how about the Prostiva? I can see how physicians shy away if the prostate is large and the prostatic urethra is long because you have to do many administration. Uh, sometimes there's some bleeding, the visibility is poor. Do you set size limits there? I think from the standpoint of the size of the prostate, you're right, you're going to have to use more lesions with the Prostiva, and that can be a limiting factor when you get these really big glands, whereas by just simply selecting a different sized antenna for the larger sized prostates, you're going to do the very same treatment with the large sized glands as you did with the smaller sized glands with just the larger antenna, so your defect is going to be commensurately larger. And I think a really important point was just made. As the technology has evolved and we have higher power units, we also now have a selection of treatment catheters that we never had before. In the early days of 
cool thermotherapy, the concept was one size fits all. Well, that's not true. And so as we have different size glands, and especially the larger glands, we now have antennas that are capable of treating a larger volume of tissue and giving us better outcomes. So the larger size glands, the multiple lesion, gets us to our next major topic, I would say. And that's that topic, how do you keep the patient comfortable in the office setting? And I know that's on the mind of many, and many have been probably trying this and working on this and developed their own concoctions of medications, injections, and so forth. So since each one of you has experience in hundreds of these procedures, let's just start out with you, Dr. Harb, and let's see what, what do you do to keep the patient comfortable during your procedures? Well, well, I always discuss with the patients before the procedure that there are some people that are just not suited for any type of office-based procedures. In fact, they request that they be completely asleep. Those aren't the right candidates for this. Um, in my practice, we, we really try to paint a picture for them. And we're tr we have to prepare them for a pain scale level between, between two and five. And that's my goal during these in-office-based procedures. And to get there, we use a, a benzodiazepine and an oral narcotic about two to three hours before this procedure. We also instill into the bladder and let it dwell for 10 to 15 minutes an aqueous solution of, of lidocaine. We also use a 2% lidocaine viscous jelly as well. Oftentimes an ultrasound guided digitally or uh, ultrasound guided block is done, but I found that in thinner patients, a digitally guided block may be just as good. I also like to use an anticholinergic, such as Ditropan, uh, several hours before the procedure. I provide these medications to the patients on the preoperative evaluation. It makes it real easy for them. So Dr. Fallon, we talked about this, and I know you have a slightly different take on the injection of lidocaine. Uh, Dr. Hopp says he can do it well, digitally guided. What is your preference? Do you agree with him? Or? Well, I think most of my preparation is very similar. Um, I do provide an anticholinergic the day before and the day after. Uh, I like to give them oral narcotics and some benzodiazepines as well. I give intraurethral lidocaine as well as some aqueous lidocaine in the bladder. And then when I do my injection uh, for cooled thermal therapy, I have typically done that slightly different. And that is because uh, when you inject the lidocaine, if you keep your lidocaine up close to where that Mount Everest peak is, where the seminal vesicles meet the prostate, you can avoid having that fluid come down behind the rectum and get behind, or behind the prostate and get behind the, rec the prostate and the rectum. And that, that lidocaine can sit there. So during your cool thermal therapy, you've got a rectal sensor and it's measuring temperature. So as the temperature comes through the prostate and is picked up by your rectal sensor, if it gets hot, then the cooling mechanism is gonna pull, pull the energy back towards the urethra and it, you're gonna lose some of your treatment, uh, your defect size. So avoiding that fluid back behind the, the rectum or behind the prostate, you're not gonna get that. Now, interestingly, I was talking to somebody about that just the other day, and they told me that one of the things they do now is if it does track down, or they, need, they have somebody who's very sensitive, they'll inject at the apex, and they'll do a rectal exam after their uh, ultrasound-guided block and massage the fluid out of there. And I personally haven't tried it, but I may try it when I get back. Thanks for that point. It's an interesting point. When I do a truss biopsy, I on purpose get the lidocaine between the rectum and the prostate. It elevates the prostate. The visibility is good with a little fluid interface. But here, I see the point. You don't want the fluid there interfering with your measurements. So uh, Dr. Puraj, I know you, you have your own ideas on selection as well as comfort management. And how do you go about it? And what are your tricks to notice? Well, let me first uh, comment on what was just said. I think the ultrasound is very, very important when you're uh, doing your block. I think you can put the uh, lidocaine where you want, and I think the, the points that were just made are excellent in terms of technique. 
But there's a certain type of patient where no matter how much lidocaine you use, no matter what strength the lidocaine is, and no matter where you put it, there's going to be a problem. And that's the problem with the patient with urgency. So when you start doing these treatments, that's probably not the patient you want to start with. Patients with urgency are going to feel that procedure, and they're going to feel it because they're going to have more urgency than they usually do. And they will feel that throughout the entire procedure. The moment the procedure is over, it stops, but it's tough for them. And so if they've got a moderate amount of urgency under normal circumstances, it's going to be a lot more significant during the procedure. It also sets the stage for how you choose therapies, because one thing I didn't mention before is if you have a patient with urgency, that patient may be better served with a Prostiva procedure as opposed to cooled thermotherapy. And the reason for that is with cooled thermotherapy, they're going to have that significant urgency for 28 and a half minutes. The moment that machine goes on, they're going to feel it. Once it ramps up to maximum power, they're going to be very uncomfortable until that procedure is over. With Prestiva, patients typically feel it most when you do the first two or three lesions right at the bladder neck. As you pull away, as you move further away from the bladder and closer to the apex, patients feel less. So if you have a patient with urgency, you might want to consider Prestiva. Thank you. You also believe in the distraction of the patients? Anybody plays music or has movies running? Oh, we've got that B. We've got a flat screen on the, t on the ceiling. The toughest part of our procedures is prying the remote control out of the patient's yeah. hand at the end. Yeah, I heard you say that. And, you know, the dentists do it, obviously. They have all kinds of things under the ceiling for us to look at. That may be a good idea in our cystoscopy suites. Okay, so we selected a good patient, the ideal patient or target patient, if you wish. We separated and differentiated the two treatments. We know what you guys are doing for the patient's comforts. Now we need to come to some data. Um, the drugs are still used for the most part. And so what would you say about the difference in efficacy uh, between the best drug treatment, let's say, and what you can achieve with the minimally invasive treatment, the CTC, and the Prostiva, Dr. Pugat, why don't you start out? Sure. You know, there's been an interesting evolution. Uh, when I trained, the concept of medication was just coming into vogue. And I remember my department chair saying to us and to uh, the other attendings on staff how this was going to be a sea change for the treatment of BPH and Terps were going to become less significant. Not a lot of people believed it, but indeed over time, medication became the mainstay of therapy. I think we're at a similar point right now where we have medication that can achieve certain results and we have minimally invasive office-based therapies that can give us significantly better results. And so one of the studies to look at, we're all familiar with the COMBAT uh, trial, and looking at alpha blockers and looking at five ARIs and looking at them individually and in combination. And it's certainly not surprising that the combination therapy was superior. But look at the results and look at what happens at 48 months. Thanks. And the maximum reduction on the IPSS is 6.3 with combination therapy. Now, remember the slide that Dr. Verborn presented earlier talking about what it takes for a reduction in IPSS for a patient to really feel good. We're not there with medication yet, but we are there with the minimally uh, invasive office-based treatments. But obviously the way to really look at this is with a controlled randomized trial. Can I have the next slide? And there are a few different studies that have been attempted. Um, we had the uh, MIST study a while ago, but it had to be terminated because of enrollment issues. So the best thing that we can look at right now goes back about 10 years. It's 2001. It's Bob Javon's study, and it looked at the results of a minimally invasive treatment versus medication. And if you look at this, at 18 months after a microwave procedure or cooled thermotherapy, symptom scores were 35% lower than in patients who were on medication. At 18 months, you had a flow rate improvement, 22% versus medication. And so we had data now that suggested for the first time that minimally invasive treatments were superior. But I would point out to you that this was a 2001 study. That was with older generation equipment, which didn't generate the levels of heat that we're able to achieve today. And so in my hands now, I, when I treat patients, I not only know that I'm getting durable results, but I'm seeing them sooner, and I'm seeing less patient discomfort during the treatment, and it's increasing patient acceptance of this particular modality. 
Thank you. So the combat trial was a four-year trial, controlled trial. So was the MTOPS trial. This is an 18-month trial. It seems like our patients want to know, will this hold up? How will this work over time? And they don't want symptom improvement for a month or a year. They want a long-term symptom improvement. So what data do you discuss with your patient, Dr. Fallon, regarding the long-term symptomatic improvement? Uh, Dr. Urban, for, for me, one of the most pivotal <clears throat> papers, at least concerning cooled thermal therapy, is the paper that you co-authored with Dr. Lance Minders from the Mayo Clinic. And I think the important thing about that is you can see readily that at three months, the AUA symptom score was decreased by 12.7 from the initial median of 20.8. So it was a greater than 50% reduction in the patient's symptom scores. And that's important because at three months, that's when we're seeing patients back. And at that point, they're very satisfied with their results. However, it's also very important to see where are they at five years. And at five years, they've decreased approximately 10, which means they're almost 50% reduced five years later, and your slides earlier clearly showed that if we're only gonna get six with combination therapy at best, and we're able to tell our patients five years later, after drugs fatigued, you're gonna have a 50% reduction, I really think we're, we're really doing something for the patient that's a positive. Clearly, so this is good data, good long-term data in a controlled setting for the CTT. What about the alternative, the Prostiva, Dr. Pubash? Is there good long-term data as well for the Prostiva that we can look at? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the first thing we want to see is the Hill paper. And can we change the slide, please? Um, and with that, uh, what this compared was having Tuna or Prostiva uh, versus having a TERP and looking at the improvement in symptom scores in a patient's quality of life. And what's striking here is, again, going back to that number of how much we have to reduce a patient's symptoms before they'll feel a lot better and be happy with the treatment. And if you look at what happens with your baseline, and just follow this to four years, now you're seeing, at, right over here, you're seeing about a nine and a half point drop over that period of time. It's durable, quality of life is similar, and so we know that Prestiva, as with cool thermotherapy, provides durable outcomes. That's the one side of the equation now. The patients also ask about the flip side, the side effects, complications. This is, after all, a procedure and not just a drug. I'm sure you'll discuss that as well. And, and what do you tell them to expect after a Prestiva treatment? Well, when you look at side effects, um, we're all familiar with what happens when we do a TERP. Um, many of us have gravitated to laser because we think it may yield less of these issues. But if you compare TERP to TUNA and you look at factors like retrograde ejaculation, ED, scar tissue formation, urinary incontinence, uh, there's a significant difference in what patients experience in a, after an OR procedure versus what they have after an office procedure. Uh, when you discuss this with your patients, when you have that informed consent discussion and tell them what may happen with the various therapies or no therapy at all, uh, and what the potential is for improvement in symptoms with the various therapies, it's not too hard for the average patient to decide they prefer to start with an office procedure. Uh, so I think there, there's very little question now that we have a dramatic reduction in side effects with office-based therapies. Well, this slide here suggests clearly a uh, side effect spectrum much more benign with the Prostiva procedure compared to a TERP. Some may argue that this rate of erectile dysfunction is a little high. I don't know, maybe it worked out in the study. But let's focus on the last line. This is what patients want to know. Is this it? What's next? Uh, do you have another device next year for me? What is the retreatment rate? Do I have to have this done again? Dr. Harb, what do you tell your patients when they ask you such a question? Well, you know, my ultimate goal in treating these patients with minimally invasive techniques is to keep them off long-term medications. For how long, I think, is the big question. In preparation for this talk, I had an opportunity to review the last 200 consecutive Prostiva procedures 
and the last 200 consecutive uh, cooled thermotherapy procedures. I had the privilege of, of using the latest generation devices because I'm kind of the youngest panelist here and, and it made a heck of a difference and I'll be able to share those, that information with you. But before I do that, I'd like to get back to the, the MINDER study. And it, these, this is a very, very important point to make that at five years, at five years, 9% of these patients needed to have some sort of surgical intervention. In addition, 11% at five years, 11% of patients needed additional medications for a total of 20%. So when we look at my data, uh, what, you, what you'll know here is, what you'll see is that, um, and this was over about a six year period, we had a 12% retreatment rate with the cooled thermotherapy patients. These are patients that required either a laser or a bipolar TERP, or, or some, and it was 12%. With the Prostiva procedure, after the 200 consecutive cases, using the newer generation, there was a 7.5% retreatment rate. So all in all, 9, 10% retreatment rate. This goes along with the study that's been published before with the cool thermotherapy. Well, that's very valuable. Um, and I'm glad that in preparation for this uh, panel, that each one of the panelists looked critically over their own data. I believe actually that having nowadays so many offices have electronic records, it's probably easier to look this up and I'm glad that we can share these personal experiences which mean so much more to the audience. Dr. Fallon, what is your perception on the retreatment rate? What is your own experience in this regard? In our private practice, we can't pick people just because they fit what the journal article said. We're having to pick patients not because we pick them oftentimes, but because they pick us. They come to their office, they have obstructive voiding symptoms, and we need to be able to treat them. And many of those people that we treat do not fit into the clinical trial patient that has the 67% five-year, uh, you know, no treatment. So I think when we treat patients in the office, we have to realize that we may not always have results exactly as good as the papers that are being presented. But for many of these patients, it's the only thing they can do. I am starting to treat more and more patients that are elderly, that maybe are on Coumadin, that maybe have Parkinson's, and I'm treating them with in-office devices that are helping them. And if they're not helped, I can honestly say we haven't been hurting them. The salvage rate is, is, is we can still take them to the OR if they're a candidate. We can still put them back with their catheters, but many of them, they are actually walking out of the office with minimally invasive therapy. And to me, that's a home run in private practice. Thanks, and again, this is uh, important. It's sort of an honest appraisal of what's real and what's doable versus what's ideal completely parenthetically and out of context, I just started to wonder if in my daily practice I would only treat patients if they fit the exact criteria for that alpha block or that combination treatment, that surgery, I think half the patients would have to walk out. I couldn't treat them. You're right. This is an important point and in real life practice it all looks a little different than in the published literature. I may take an issue with the last point. I don't think the success definition is different, but the expectation of that success has to be tempered by the patients that, as you pointed out, they seek us out, and we're not seeking them out to enroll in our trial. Dr. Pugas, you have a very large numerical experience with these treatments, and you looked up your own uh, experience as well. Maybe you can discuss uh, what your experience has been. Sure. Uh, starting back in 1998, uh, I've done about 1,100 procedures now. And the majority of these are cool thermotherapy, and a little bit less than 300 are Prostiva. And so I looked at my numbers, and my retreatment rate's actually a little bit higher than what's been discussed so far, but I think in large part 
that may be due to the fact that my numbers go back 14 years. And so over that period of time with the cool thermotherapy, we've got an, I've got an 18% retreatment rate. And then of the Prestiva group, there's a 6% retreatment rate. Uh, and of that group, those patients who required retreatment all had TERPs. Let me just ask you a quick question, anybody who has done retreatments, is there anything differently about doing a TERPs or could you also do a green light laser the same way? Has anybody had experience with a laser? I have performed uh, lasers on uh, a few individuals who have failed uh, Prostiva and uh, I've treated patients who have had the older technology microwaves with TERP and laser and I haven't noticed any increase in complications whatsoever, and they've done quite well. So I was asking mostly on account of the fact that the green light laser is uh, blood dependent, hemoglobin dependent for absorption, and some of the tissue is probably reconfigured and more fibrotic, but you hadn't noticed any differences. N not significant with cool yeah. thermotherapy. Dr. Pugac, have you used the laser or just the TERP? Just TERP. Just the TERP. And maybe that's safer. And, and, and actually, I think the TERP is uh, the backup procedure if things don't work out. And, and it works out almost always in those patients then. So we're coming to the end of our uh, prepared discussion here on our panel discussion. I hope you thought that we tried to address those topics from patient selection to the differentiation between the two treatments, CTT and Prostiva, the management of patient comfort, to actually comparison of outcome data and long-term treatment data or retreatments. And lastly, there is the cost data. And this is, uh, first of all, very important and ever growing in importance. And secondly, a moving target. Because you know and I know that reimbursements change for procedures. Drugs become generic. So the parameters and the base assumptions change continuously. I show you here one slide from Michael Naslund. And the one take-home message perhaps is this. If you do a successful procedure, and that could be now a surgery, a prostiva, or a microwave, and that patient goes on and is pleased with it, there's not much add-on cost over time. You know, only those few patients who have retreatments add to the cost. But the drugs, of course, they compound their costs because every day, every month, there's a new prescription. And so the crossover in this analysis for combination therapy was after two and a half years, but after five years, even the cheaper drugs caught up with the one-time expenditure for the minimally invasive treatment and crossed over. Again, the baseline assumptions continuously change the cost of the procedure as well as the cost of the drugs. But it is important for us to reflect on that, and I would say as a general rule, a well-executed procedure with a very low retreatment rate is a cost-effective way of uh, treating our patients. So we, I think we covered the entire range of possible questions and issues. The first question, who is a good patient? The second question, who is a good patient for Prostiva or CTT? How do we manage the patients in the office? How do we identify those who may or may not do well in the office? And then what do we discuss with the patient? What treatment outcomes give, do we give to them for their expectation? And how long are these treatments going to last uh, for our patients? So at this point, we have 10 minutes time in the hour. And if there is any questions, there are some microphones. And then there are cards on the table. And you can write down a question or come to the center aisle microphone. And we can even turn the light on. I can, but maybe somebody can. Uh, and if you want to identify yourself and to whom you address the question, that would be also very welcome. Uh, Russell Williams from Houston, Texas. I've done uh, several hundred of the prostivas. I've not done the cool thermal therapy. And a couple points that uh, I'd like to bring up to the panel, Steve, as part of the patient preparation. One thing that I do is I give um, Avidar or postcard to the patients a couple of uh, uh, days before the procedure under the hopes that it would uh, decrease the amount of bleeding I have during the procedure. Granted, it's a, mi it's a minor thing. I don't know if the, if the panel has any experience with that. And the uh, second thing is that when I do the prostatic block, I have done it all through a transurethra, through a cystoscopic uh, block. And I tried the transrectal um, just because there was a problem with the needles being available to do a transurethral. And I noticed that in the patients that I did the transrectal, there was a little bit more pain in those patients than I got when I was doing a transurethral. Thank you very much. I have uh, uh, two uh, comments. First of all, 
the five ARIs uh, actually reduce very quickly within two weeks the expression of vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, in the periurethral glands. This is believed the mechanism by which hematuria, hemospermia, and bleeding during TURP is affected. So even a short treatment may induce that. So question to the panel, has anybody treated men who have been on finasteride or avodot, and did you notice any difference, specific to the prostiva now? Uh, I, I haven't done it for, for the uh, minimally invasive, but I have used it for TURPs. There, the study has just been published where two weeks has been good to decrease the, they've shown a decrease in blood loss with, with TURPs, but not with the prostiva. Any experience with that? I, I would just say I've, I've treated many patients who've been on combination studies or drugs. I haven't noticed any difference in, in terms of treating them. Um, but, uh, you know, it's interesting if, if two weeks can actually make a difference. Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's shown histologically. I don't know if it makes clinically a difference. But I, I heard you mention and him mention, and I know myself, uh, in a prostiva with multiple application, there is that fear. I don't want to get bleeding because of the visibility issue. That fear is there, and this is a point of worse consideration. The, the second point is, what do you use transurethrally? Do you use like an Alboron bridge, and do you use like a injection needle, like the Botox injection needle or something like that? I do. I use the, uh, the collagen injection needle. Collagen, yeah. Bar. yeah. Yeah. And it fits nicely into a small 19-string cystoscope. Right. There is that moment where you have to get across the stride of sphincter with yeah. using the lidocaine jelly. Um, and, but the, the block, once it's in place, is perfect because it's, it's really periurethral into the central zone and, and it really provides a nice block. I just haven't been able to do as well transrectally. Mm -hmm. I, I have to admit that I don't know and I don't think there's extensive literature on the nerve distribution within the prostate, but you're injecting the lidocaine directly into the prostate on purpose, not where the nerves enter, where we think it enters on the back side in the corner with the seminal vesicle, but rather right into it. Yes, I inject where I think I'll be actually doing my treatments, in the, in the median lobe, in the lateral lobes, coming from the bladder neck out towards the apex. Mm -hmm. Any opinions on that? That's, that's interesting. I have not uh, injected transurethrally. I have tried everything I can think of transrectally, from the standard block that we do now to injecting just under the capsule on both sides, posteriorly and at the apex. That didn't seem to make any difference either. And I'm talking about patients with urgency. Uh, so I'd be interested to see what the results are from uh, transurethral injection. Well, something to take home perhaps yeah. and to try out. Uh, I think many of us will have the collagen injection apparatus. Thank you very much. One last quick point. Yes. I noticed up on the slide, the retrograde ejaculation was noted down as a zero. I think that one thing that's important for my patients is I tell them they'll have a decreased volume of ejaculation. It might not be true retrograde ejaculation as it might be just desiccation of the prostate, closure of the, of the ejaculatory ducts. Mm -hmm. I see that. Good point. Thank you. One other comment or question? Thank you. Dr. Mansfield from Washington State. Three quick issues for anyone on the panel. I have no experience with this technology. Your thoughts on obese patients? on fully anticoagulated patients, and how is their first month with irritated symptoms? Yes, so I think the irritative symptoms, you heard Dr. Pugas raise a warning finger saying, don't be too keen, don't make that your first target patient. If the patient has a lot of urgency, uh, will not be your most grateful customer. Is that an adequate paraphrasing? Is that? I, I think that's a good paraphrasing, but as far as irritative symptoms, I, I would say this. Um, in the early days when we did not cool urethras with uh, the, the level of cooling that we have today, there was a lot of irritation afterwards. There were also patients who went into prolonged periods of retention. With the advanced cooling systems that we now have with cool thermotherapy, uh, we just don't see that. Um, so I will tell you that it's rare for a patient to have any significant increase in symptoms or de novo symptoms if they haven't had them before after one of these treatments. So the, the second point about the anticoagulation, I think we can have a show of hands. Do you treat with cool thermotherapy if the patient is on aspirin? Yes or no? What if the patient is on Plavix, cool thermotherapy? Yes or no? Uh, so I think there is your answer. I mean, I would do that too. How about Prostiva? Aspirin? Mm, probably not. Plavix? 
So uh, there goes your choice, you know, if you have no experience and uh, since you can bring in these machines on a lease by, per, by case base, uh, if you have a patient on intercoagulation, the, the CTT would be the thing to strive for. And I think every panel member here has experience with patients on any kind of anticoagulation, and I would certainly agree with that. Uh, Dr. Scott Zeck from Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, can you all comment on uh, post-procedure care, length of catheter, additional medications, how long we're using them, alpha blockers, anticholinergics, others? Yeah, so the first question is important. Do you leave a catheter or not, or do you make that dependent where the patient lives? <laughs> Uh, I, I've gotten in the habit of just giving a patient a catheter for two days and that's primary because when we tried to do it without we were seeing patients in the ER, uh, patients who were trying to avoid the ER who then became uh, overly distended and uh, for me I just tell the patients you know you're going to have a urologist place a CUDE catheter while you're still anesthetized and you're going to wear it for a couple of days. And with cool thermal therapy, uh, the retreatment for or the recatheter rate after removing it is exceedingly low. And so we don't automatically teach them self-cath or anything like that. And I, I think it's an acceptable thing. I mean, most of these guys who have any other procedure, there's a a certain level of having to have a catheter or, be, or, or having to be catheterized in the ER. Yeah. Dr. Pugash, catheter, yes, no? Uh, it depends. If I do cold thermotherapy, I try to leave them without a catheter. Uh, on my catheterization rate is 30% with CTT or cold thermotherapy. With Prostiva, everybody gets a catheter. Prostiva generates a hotter temperature, catheter stays in for five days because of the swelling. Two days for Prostiva and generally five to seven days for cooled thermotherapy. I use uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories to help decrease some of the swelling after 80, 80 to 100 kilojoules of energy uh, with the cooled thermotherapy. I think there's a lot of swelling and I, I try to let that resolve over several wow. days. Well, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised by the five to seven days that I heard. That seems long but I'm sure it's based on practical experiences and maybe from phone calls, so maybe that's a good practical advice to leave it in a little bit longer to avoid follow-up calls. Anybody places patients on alpha blockers or anticholinergics in follow-up? I don't start them on it, but if they've been taking medication, they'll continue it for six weeks mm -hmm. before I stop it. My, my first visit back at, at uh, four weeks out, uh, we, we stop it. I stop the alpha blocker therapy. Uh, I also do not initiate alpha blockers if they haven't been on them, but if they're on them, I continue them until the six-week follow-up. For patients who have cooled thermal therapy, who have very large glands, uh, and I say specifically 60, 80 grams or more, uh, some of those patients I will treat them and then place them on Avidart if they have very, very large glands because I, I feel like I'm treating the gland that they have, but I'm not, with, with microwave or uh, cool thermal therapy, but I'm not treating how they got there. Mm -hmm. So for some of these guys, especially if they're younger with a very large gland, I talk to them about not only treating them so they can void, but treating them so they don't come back. Good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good points. I would like to also uh, uh, state that Urologics was asked by the AUA next year to put on a hands-on course and I'm sure they would welcome that opportunity to bring their devices into the uh, hands-on uh, um, course environment here where, where actually physicians can get a hands-on experience because there are some, like you stated, who have no personal experience and, and maybe some of you are right there next year and showing folks how to do everything you talked about theoretically today. Thank you so much for coming for this uh, panel discussion and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the, your stay here at the AUA in Atlanta. Thank you so much.